Good morning, crew. Man, it is good being here. So uh, crew actually had a pretty big impact on my life. About 20 years ago, I was a college student at the University of Oregon, and there were a number of crew staff and others who poured into me and invested in me and pointed me to Jesus. And so I, it had a big impact, and I'm really grateful. It feels like coming full circle to be back here with you all today. And uh, I'm just really grateful for the work that you do week in and week out and honored to be here. So I want to talk this morning about a, something I like to call the hero spot. It seems to me in our culture that many of us are grasping after the hero spot, longing to be kind of at the center of attention, of influence, of authority, uh, to be seen as relevant and significant and change makers in our world. Let me give you an example of what I mean. So uh, back in the day, I had the chance to work on the Navajo Reservation for about six months, and I was blown away by these phenomenal native leaders while there that were just doing amazing work and ministry in their, in their context, and just blown away by the impact of what they were doing. And back in that era, there were a number of movies coming out about native peoples. So Dances with Wolves, for example, was coming out, right? And this is a movie about the Sioux. And so uh, I, I was curious to see, all right, which native leader are they going to pick to represent and depict the Sioux? Is that coming up on, on there? There we go. Which native leader are they going to pick to represent and depict the Sioux? Which of the Sioux will, will be kind of in that hero spot, that lead role, to uh, represent their people in this Academy Award-winning film about the Sioux? So I pop in the DVD, and I'm ready and waiting for it, and it is Kevin Costner. <laughs> Kevin. Kevin? All right. Kevin is kind of at the center of the story, right? And kind of over on the side, his sidekick, you've got the native dude who's sort of looking off at an eagle in the distance or something. And if you can see the full poster down underneath Kevin is kind of the buffalo hunt and the traditional, you know, uh, riders on the horses and all. But at the center of the whole story is Kevin, eyes gazing forward with vision into the future, hipster mustache and all. <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> All right, well, Dances with Wolves. Two years later, Last of the Mohicans comes out. And so I'm like, all right, well, this is a movie about the Mohicans. Which Mohican are they going to pick to represent and depict their people? And it is Daniel Day-Lewis. A British dude, what? Playing an English settler. I would suggest these movies are less, not so much about the native experience as they are about the white person's experience of the native people, right? And here's my point that we like to see ourselves in the hero spot. We like to see ourselves at the center of the story. And my point is not so much about Hollywood, like, Hollywood, come on, why can't you make the movies differently, better, whatever. Uh, my point is about us. Hollywood makes the movies this way because we like to see them this way, right? There's a sense that we like to see ourselves in the kind of hero central role of the story. And if you get enough of your tribe, your group, your crew who's buying the movie tickets, they'll make the movie about you. Now, here's the thing. I would suggest that this same dynamic is often at play in the way that we approach international mission. We often like to see ourselves in this hero spot, at the center of the story. In terms of, hey, we're bringing this money, this resource, this technology, this wealth to the table. The story should kind of center around us. Right? Like, we're buying the movie ticket, so make the movie about us. And I think this can show up in the way that we talk about our work overseas. Uh, look how many wells we've drilled, look how many schools we've built, look how many churches we've planted. Uh, there was this need, and then we swooped in from the outside and fixed it, and now it's, it's fixed, right? We kind of placed ourselves at the center of the story. And on one hand, I get it, right? Like, if you're a nonprofit, you need to report back to your donors, here's what we're doing with your dollars. If you are, for a lot of you, you know, with supporters, it's like we need to let it know our supporters know. We're not just kind of sitting around on our hands. Uh, but I think there's a danger that if we're not paying attention, we can start to kind of buy into the myth that we are actually at the center of the story rather than the locals on the ground day in, day out, week in, and week out. And what's crazy is when God goes, who am I going to put at the center of my story within these communities, God actually does the craziest thing. He goes, it's going to be my local church. The local church is going to be my spearhead into the community. And, 
And the beautiful thing is that God has raised up, he's established local churches around the world, and he has raised up indigenous leaders who know their language, who know their culture, who know their context. They know the people in their communities, and God has given them vision for reaching out and engaging their communities. And here's the other thing. It strikes to me that Jesus did not grasp after the hero spot. Philippians 2 seems to be kind of our theme this week, right? And Philippians 2 says, Jesus, though he was in very nature God, though he kind of, he was at the center of the glory of the Father, he had this hero spot. He didn't have to grasp for it. He was at the center of the story. But it says, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped after. Another version said, he did not consider a gain to be exploited to his own advantage. And rather instead, he made himself nothing. He poured himself out. He emptied himself. He took on our flesh, our pain, our suffering, and ultimately even our death through death on a cross. He bent down to serve us in order to lift us up before God. So I want to ask, as we follow Jesus as kind of leaders in our context, what might it look like for us to be willing to give up the hero spot and be able to lift up others and leverage platform for them to shine. Right? So if we're gonna do that this morning, I think there's three paradigm shifts I wanna offer in terms of how we see our partners and those internationally. And I wanna share these through sharing some stories of some of my heroes around the world on the ground. So paradigm shift number one, I think we need to recognize that they make a better ranger. Okay? They make a better ranger. What I mean by that is I think there can be a tendency, I see it in myself of kind of going, all right, dude, I want you to be the sidekick, but I want to be at the center of this story. Uh, you can play Tonto, but I get to be the ranger, kind of deal, right? And the reality is they make a much better ranger. They know their language, they know their context, they're embedded in, the, in, in those communities. And uh, so let me share a story as an example. This is uh, Abraham up here. Abraham is a friend of mine. He's a pastor in Cambodia. Let me show you a little bit about uh, Abraham's community where he has a church. Uh, the community is a displaced community of about 9,000 people. So they were in the heart of Phnom Penh, the capital, and their land was wanted by an international company for a skyscraper, and they were poor, and there were some corrupt Cambodian officials who said, we can make a lot of money off this deal. So about 5 a.m. in the morning, the police rolled in, riot gear, flatbed pickup trucks. They loaded the 9,000 people onto these trucks, carted them outside the city, and dumped them in a field. Their homes got torn down. They lost everything. Abraham and his family knew this community, and they saw what was going on, and they felt called by God to move incarnationally into the field with the community. They moved in, they used their life savings to $6,000 to start a small school there. It would function as the church on Sundays. And it began to counsel families as they were grieving and kind of processing and began helping the community to rebuild. So when I first met Abraham, he was saying, you know, one of the biggest things that we're facing right now is we need roofs because the rainy season's coming. And right now it's just kind of torn up tarps on, on sticks and all, you know. And he's like, the rainy season's coming and when it rains here, it dumps, like it pours. He's like, you can imagine being a mom with four kids and the rain's kind of coming down through the, the roof and keeping everyone up at night and there's no sewage, you know, sanitation, so it mixes with the sewage on the ground and before long, it's up to knee high in this field and that brings the mosquitoes and they're carrying malaria and we're looking at a humanitarian disaster. So we brought a Christian nonprofit in, we began to brainstorm, okay, let's think together, how do we do this? And the plan became, all right, Josh, you and your church, you're not going to come in from the outside and build the homes for the folks. They already know construction. Abraham, you're not going to bring your crew from Phnom Penh in either. What we're going to do is, Abraham, your local church, uh, we're going to organize, the, uh, the church is going to organize the community into family groups of five. And you get free roofing materials if you help the other four families in your group build their home. Like, Josh, your church will provide the roofing materials. They can't afford that, but they can't afford the wood. They can cut it down locally, or they can, they can get the wood. And it turns into this crazy, like, an old Amish barn raising, right, where 9,000 people come up, and almost overnight, like, all these homes get built, and this place, this whole village, erects off the ground. And one of the crazy things Abraham said was, uh, you know, he's like, I've seen stuff like this go down in the past, and often what happens is uh, I see the guys kind of on the sidelines, and they look dejected is to see the outsiders come in and do the work for him. And there's a sense of going, man, I can't even provide for my family, for my community. But when this was going on, there's a sense of pride and dignity and ownership. And he's like, I had this flood of men rushing into the church on Sunday for the first time and saying, can you tell us more about this Jesus? Because he gave us our dignity back. Mm -hmm. 
gave us our dignity back. Well, this is just the beginning. It grew out from there into things like uh, more education and sanitation and uh, clean water and electricity and all sorts of things, all led by the local church and all with strong community ownership. My point here, though, is that it's helpful for me to go, I'm going to be the sidekick here, right? Like, Abraham makes a better ranger. I'm going to be the sidekick. So we see here that there was a role that we played, right, as kind of a church coming in from the outside, an international church. Um, but we wanted to put Abraham in that, that kind of lead role, that hero spot, so in his church. So there's a sense that, like, yeah, we're bringing roofs and we're bringing a relationship, but we're entrusting the kind of lead role to them. We're, support, we're the sidekick there in, in the lead role, right? And the nonprofit, kind of like us too, is going, yeah, we're bringing uh, a, a development expertise, and we're bringing accounting structure, and we're bringing a lot to the table too, but we're coming in a supporting role that's trying to lift up and bolster the witness of the local church and the community. And then Abraham and the local church, they got that spot, and then they're passing it over too and going, hey, we're going to give this away, and you guys are going to lead and own this as well. I think it's a beautiful picture. We come back to this and go on, they make better rangers, right? They know their community. Abraham knows the people in his community. Uh, his church knows they're connected there. And the beauty is when I leave, when we leave, when we're back on the plane and we're back home, they're still there week in and week out. They're embedded in their community. They are the ones God has called to embody the presence of Jesus week in and week out in their community. <clears throat> well, and when we don't do this, I think it can lead to trouble. So a little while later, there was a group that came in, another international group that came in. They're like, hey, man, we see you guys need sanitation, so we want to build like this half-million-dollar bathroom right in the heart of the slum. And <laughs> Abraham and the locals were like, no, 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 don't do it, you know? Because if you do it, you're either, you catch 22, you're either going to have to charge for it, and no one's going to want to pay when it's free in the, in the field next door, or you make it free, and it's going to run down, and it'll get run down and, and won't uh, be maintained well. Uh, there's no local ownership in this process, but they did it anyways, and Abraham thinks they kind of, you know, they, Abraham was like, you could actually tap into the local sewer line and go directly into people's homes. They would own it. It would be theirs, uh, but he thought, you know, I think they wanted to see the picture they could send back home going, look what we built, right? And so they did, and sure enough, six months later, empty, unused, falling apart, a waste of space in an already cramped slum environment. There's a danger when we don't invest in and give the lead role to the locals who are embedded on the ground. Okay, well, let's go to uh, point number two here. <clears throat> I would say another paradigm shift, a second one would be we need to move from seeing those that we serve or partner with overseas as, re as simply recipients of ministry to seeing them as agents of ministry. Going from seeing them as recipients to seeing them as agents. An uh, example here would be uh, New. This is my friend New. New is a rural farmer in Vietnam. She's one of my heroes. She's an amazing hero of the faith. So uh, New, a uh, rural farmer, she has HIV. And currently she oversees HIV support groups for about 1,500 women throughout her region of Vietnam. And a little bit of New's story back about 10 years ago. New first found out she had HIV when uh, her husband, she saw her husband withering away and they realized he had AIDS. She got it from him, was infected by him, and uh, he passed away a week before their third child was born. And for news, suddenly, this was devastating. On a personal level, she's grieving going, uh, man, I've lost my spouse. He probably got it through drugs or prostitution, that sense of betrayal. Uh, and what's gonna happen to my kids? Like, I'm facing death now. What's gonna happen to me when I'm gone, them when I'm gone? New also saw in her community uh, there was this impact where no one wanted to come around her anymore, right? Like, no local information. It's like, ah, oh, if she breathes on me, am I going to get it? So family and friends and others stayed away. And on a work level, she's now the primary breadwinner for her family, her three kids, but no one will buy her vegetables on the market anymore. No one will hire her for work. She's isolated and alone in a difficult spot. Well, fortunately, uh, Bien heard about and attended uh, an HIV training, uh, church-based, uh, kind of a church-led HIV training uh, nearby. 
And she got to know more about the disease she had. She learned about antiretroviral medications, how to fight back against it. And she met a number of other women from her area there who were also suffering and surviving with it. And they said, hey, let's band together. And, and Bien said, we can meet in my house and let's form a support group. And so when one person in the group got sick, that about 20, 25 people, when one gets sick, the other women would come and they would help clean the house and cook and take care of the kids until that person got better. And then when someone else got sick, they would all go do the same thing for them. And they began to lift and build each other up. And then when the community saw this group of 25 women, they started raising community awareness. Because it's easy to ignore new when it's just her, that one person, right? But it's a lot harder to ignore when it's suddenly 25 women in the village. And pretty soon they were getting hired for work again. The local understanding of, of things was, was changing. But perhaps most significantly, knew would tell you is that she met Jesus. Like one of the, uh, the trainers from this uh, the HIV training invested in her and, and, and also shared the impact that Christ had had in her life. And knew just like went crazy, just wanted to devour everything she could learn about Jesus. Uh, she received Christ and just went full throttle after him. And before he knew it, she was just coming back and sharing with all the other women in the group, oh my gosh, did you know who God is? And they said, we want to follow him too. And then neighbors and others started seeing and going, oh my gosh, like we want to follow him too. We see this transformation. And pretty soon, uh, New is leading a house church of 40 people, the first in her village. <clears throat> well, my point here <clears throat> would be that uh, <laughs> if you would have gone back 10 years ago, you would have seen New as a recipient of ministry, not as an agent of ministry right? Like if we had kind of walked in and gone with a clipboard and gone, okay, who do we want to kind of lead this gospel movement in this village, in this region? We would have seen that, uh, all right, well, vocation, she's a farmer. Uh, income, poor. Uh, education, weak, not much. Influence, none. Health, sick, right? Bien, knew she would have been one of the last kids picked according to kind of our general worldly kind of standards that we'd be, metrics that, that we often look for. But here's the thing, God loves taking the last kids picked and making them the center of his redemptive story. Right? God loves taking the last kids picked and making them the center. We see this throughout scripture, right? Like throughout the Old Testament, like God goes, he's looking out on the mighty ancient empires of the world and Babylon and Assyria and Rome and all, and he's going, I'm going to take Israel, right? Like a nation of slaves getting their tails kicked on the outskirts of the empire. They're depicted as the last and the least and the weakest, and God goes, that's my crew. I'm going to put them at the center of the nations and show my glory through them. You go to David and his seven brothers, and you know Samuel's there, and they're looking and going, or is it him? No, is it him? No, is it him? It's got to be, you know, like, he's, he's strong, he's smart, he's handsome, he's wise. And they get down to the end and going, that's all there is. And God's like, I want the runt out in the field that you guys didn't even think was worthy to show up. And he's going to become King David, like Jesus' great, great, great grandfather, one of the most significant kings in Israel's history. In the New Testament, Jesus' disciples are a motley crew of tax collectors and zealots and fishermen and the whole deal. They were not the ancient cream of the crop. They were a mess. But God loves taking the last kids picked and making them the center of his story. God does that. I think the question is, will we? Do we? Do we have that on our radar? Is there a sensitivity to the Spirit a discernment to the spirits movement when we're looking for who to invest with leadership and to, uh, to give platform and, and those things too, are we willing to go there? <clears throat> well, when we do, when we kind of move from seeing them as merely recipients of ministry to agents of ministry, I think their faith might surprise you. Right? Like one of the things that happened with New shortly after this was um, when this church kind of started early on, was getting off the ground, uh, some of the locals were getting nervous, right? Because the perception was Christianity is this foreign religion, it feels threatening. Uh, so some of the local authorities came house to house to everyone's uh, door and said, unless you renounce Jesus and shut this thing down, we're going to cut off your HIV medication, which was essentially threatening them with death. 
and a lot of folks bailed. This isn't what I signed up for, right? But New and a number of others said, dude, we're in. It's Jesus alone, right? I asked, I asked New, I'm like, when you first found out you had HIV, you were so afraid of dying. You were scared of death. But now, something changed, and you weren't. Like, what was it that changed? And she told me this. She said, before I was so scared of being dead, but now I know it means going home with the Father, so we're very confident and no longer afraid because we know that our Lord controls everything and we are safe in his care. Man. <clears throat> Bien is one of my heroes, right? Like she's come and spoken at Archish and, I, and I, it's been an inspiration. We've learned a ton from her. She's an agent who's ministered to us as well. <clears throat> well, they went on, uh, things changed. Uh, some friends kind of snuck them from Hanoi. They brought up and snuck them HIV medications, and so they were able to sustain. And the church's reputation in the community began to change. Uh, they uh, began to say, God calls us to love and to serve our neighbors. And so they started an outreach center for prostitutes in the area and began to serve and care for and love on them. They started small businesses. Uh, this picture here is uh, Bien, she's holding mushrooms from one of the mushroom businesses they started that's just thriving and employing a bunch of women in the area. Uh, they started a number of businesses that are thriving, and they've reached out and just done phenomenal work in their community. And so things changed, and Bien actually got lifted up by the government to oversee the HIV work in that entire province now. She's received international grants, and kind of like Joseph's story, right, where she's now in this position of influence and respected, not in spite of her work with the church, but even with, in, and through it. And as I talk with her, there's this thing she likes to tell me. She says, Josh, I am so grateful for my HIV, because without it, I wouldn't have met Jesus. And I was like, what? Like, you tell me that... The thing that was the most tragic, the most traumatic, the bomb that blew your life apart, and you're grateful because it's where you encountered Christ and that you love Jesus more. Right? Their faith can surprise you, right? humbles me. If I had more time, I'd tell you about Dr. Min, the Vietnamese doctor who sold, he didn't sell, he just gave his house to become the first Christian medical clinic in Hanoi. I'd tell you about the prostitutes and uh, disabled in the area who started these thriving businesses uh, and are preaching Christ to their community. I would tell you about the drug addicts who uh, have, have recovered and now are some of the strongest preachers in Hanoi and the surrounding area. But God takes those that we would overlook, and he doesn't just see them as recipients of our ministry, he sees them as agents of ministry in their own right. All right, we talked local, but I kind of want to, uh, international, but I kind of want to move to local as well, right? Because I think these things we're talking about are not just for the international scene, I think they, they play out domestically right here at home as well. So the third shift I want to offer here would be, uh, <clears throat> so now they make better rangers and uh, seeing them as agents, not just recipients. But third would be, they have better ideas than you and I do. <laughs> they have, the people in my church have better ideas about how to reach our city than I do, right? The people in your ministry may have better ideas for how to reach your campus or whatever area you're in than you do. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We don't have to be afraid of that. We can tap into that, right? <clears throat> so we have a saying at our church, pastors can't start ministries. <laughs> which probably sounds a little odd at first, right? Okay, Josh, you're the local ministries pastor. And what most people think that means is like, okay, so I go out and I start this ministry and I try and mobilize our people into it and they're going to go and do this thing. Uh, but no, we want to flip that script upside down and go, hey, we start from the premise, we believe God has gifted our church body, his, his people, with talent, with vision, with gifting, with imagination, with experience, and the places that they're embedded in. And we want to go, dude, how, my role is rather to try and surface that gifting their vision, and to try and equip it and unleash it and just pour fuel on the fire and come alongside them and what they want to do. So one of the ways we do that, every year we started this thing a while back we call missional grants, right? And missional grants, we just open up the floodgates, and anyone who wants to can start a ministry. Well, they can apply to, for a grant to start a ministry. And then our board kind of walks alongside them and, and assesses it and discerns, and we usually get about 20 applications a year. Uh, about five usually get awarded every year. And the other 15 or so, we kind of shepherd them and walk through finding the most strategic way to implement their passion uh, somewhere else. 
And it's just been phenomenal to see what God has done over the years through their vision. So let me give you an example. This is Howard. Howard is one of my heroes. He's an amazing guy. <clears throat> Howard wanted to get engaged in kind of the anti-trafficking piece, right? His heart was broken over the exploitation, the sexual exploitation of children. And he said, I want to get in this game. So for a couple of years, he was involved in kind of the raising awareness and trying to partner with the police department and uh, the resource center in town and other things. And, and he was doing a lot. And as he was embedded in that area and learning more, he had an idea. He talked with the Portland police and said, hey, what if we did a partnership? If I could mobilize 10 guys from our church and we could uh, basically do this thing they end up calling Cyber Patrol, right? Where these guys get together for a patrol night uh, and they post ads online as if they're underage girls. And then they begin receiving the texts and the phone calls that start coming in. And they pick up the phone and go, hi, this is Howard. We're with uh, the Portland Police Department. We have your number and we need you to listen for a few minutes. Right? <laughs> And they began educating them and raising awareness on the exploitative nature of what they're doing, right? You're not helping put her through school. This is how this thing works. They offer resources for those who are in sexual addiction. Right? And they also then take and pass off those phone numbers to the police department who correlates them with names. And then they send out letters to these guys. A letter in the mail that looks like a traffic ticket, right? Dear so-and-so, you were found responding to such and such ad with a picture of it. Uh, we have your name, we have your info, you better stop or, you know, this is going on your record. And you can imagine if you're that guy, like that guy is hoping that his wife is not the one who gets the mail that day, right? <laughs> because it's taken something that's done in the darkness, in anonymity and all that, and it's bringing it out into the light and it's exposing it, right? Well, Howard, they had this pilot, they did 10 patrols with you know, these 10 guys, and they, uh, they, they got like 600 unique phone numbers. So they expanded it, they got 50, they, they opened up the gates, they got 50 guys trained, and then they did it, and within that first year, they had over 3,000 unique phone numbers. One of the craziest things happened next, they were here in Colorado at a conference, a national anti-trafficking conference. They were asked to kind of present on what they were doing, so they shared the story, and after them, the next group got up, and they said, uh, hey, we're from two universities. They were from, I believe it was Arizona State and uh, University of Colorado. And they said, we have been researching and monitoring online, you know, trafficking online for the last uh, few years, right? And we have this crazy blip that we couldn't understand that in all these cities across the country, it's been constant. But in Portland, and they pulled up this graph, there was this massive dip. <laughs> and they worked their way back and they pinpointed it started right at the time that Howard and his crew got rolling with Cyber Patrol. Right? Howard has better ideas than I do. <laughs> and that is a good thing, right? Really quick, one more. Jelana is a foster parent, and she uh, is amazing. They've adopted a number of kids through foster care. So she rallied some of the other foster families in the church and said, hey, how can we mobilize the body of Christ to actually engage some of the most vulnerable kids in our city? So they started going, well, what if we made, like, we'll call them welcome boxes, and it's like a nice, cute photo storage box, and we'll put toys and gifts and crowns and activities and a loving note, handwritten note, to children who are entering foster care as a signpost of love from the body of Christ to these kids. Then she said, and then they, they were brainstorming, they go, and what if we went to the, uh, the, the, the child welfare offices around town and we did makeovers? Because we've been there, we're there with our vulnerable families that we're, we're meeting with, and it's like bullet holes and shattered windows and furniture and paint that hasn't been updated in over 30 years. So what if we did a makeover? And then what if we did a foster parents night out where we could have children and foster parents from all across the city come and drop their kids off and we get to send the parents away for a date night, get some much needed rest and refreshment. Uh, a lot of these kids have extreme emotional and behavioral issues, so care for your marriage. And we get to throw a big, massive bash party and just love on these kids like no tomorrow, right? 
<clears throat> and then they were like, and what if we did a, a, a support class where people who were interested could come and they'd actually get to meet foster parents who've been doing this for a while and get a realistic picture of what they might be stepping into and get a gospel framework for what they're doing. And we can start a support group for people who are in it where we can stay connected and know one another. So they get all this stuff rolling and pretty soon other friends and other, you know, people start hearing about it like, dude, we want to do that too. And so Jelana, you know, they're training them. And before you know it, uh, this movement starts called Embrace Oregon. 80 churches throughout the Portland metro area involved with child welfare. Uh, it's been a few years in, and now there have been, the, our, their goal was, th can we make 300 of these welcome boxes? There's now been 11,000 that have outfitted the entire Portland metro area's child welfare. There have now been 10 of these extreme makeovers on the child welfare offices led by churches across the city, totaling $207,000 in donations on top of labor and manpower and renovating the places where our city's most vulnerable children go. There, have been eight of the, there are now eight of these foster parents' night outs occurring around the city at churches, churches throwing parties for vulnerable kids and loving on them. In our church, it's about 70 volunteers, 150 kids a month that come and just get loved on for four to five hours uh, by the church. And uh, there are now over 100 families that have stepped into foster care. And I look at that and I just go, I wouldn't have thought of that, right? Because Jelana and Howard they have better ideas than I do. And that's a good thing. I could go on, there are about 20 of these ministries that have popped and things, initiatives, some of them big, some of them smaller, uh, but all of them unleashing the body of Christ with the vision, the gifting, the imagination that God's given them to bring the presence of Jesus into the, the, our city, right? And the reality is, they have better ideas than I do, and there are people in your ministries that likely have better ideas than you do, and that's a good thing, that's okay. There are probably, I know many of you are on campus ministries, and your students, they are in the dorms. They know, to use the analogy, they know the language, they know the culture, they know the context, they're embedded in their classes, and they have insight in ways that however close we live on campus, however much we do, uh, we're not gonna be able to gain that perspective that they have because they're in it from the inside out. So how can we tap into that? How can we create avenues and resources for accessing their gifting and equipping and shepherding and unleashing? Because our goal should not be to contain their vision, our goal should be to unleash the vision that God's given them, right? Yeah. Our vision should not be to control them, it should be to shepherd them in the process, to come alongside. And that we don't need the hero spot. We don't need to be in the limelight. Let's put them there and let's come alongside and wrap around and shepherd and support. Right? And when we do that, when we create space for them to lead, I think we give dignity, right? Like we bring dignity. Internationally and locally, we bring dignity. My own story, I'm Mexican on my mom's side, and I can remember growing up and with my grandparents and all, uh, and seeing some of their struggles and hearing them process as they had come out of uh, kind of the barrio and were kind of assimilating into mainstream culture, and some of the struggle they had of not seeing uh, Hispanic leaders represented kind of as role models, given platform, given things in society. They talked about it producing a certain uh, sense of shame at one level, right? I think there's something powerful, there's a dignity that's been bestowed, and we create space for diverse leadership to flourish and to give rise to the unique perspectives and giftings and talent that we all bring to the table in the unique ways that God has made us so that the kingdom of God can flourish here on earth as it is in heaven. Let's land this plane. <laughs> all right, let's land the plane here. Uh, I'm struck, we started kind of Philippians 2, right, where Jesus pours himself out. And it's interesting, scholars would say that that's actually a Eucharistic hymn. What that means, it's a hymn, it's one of the earliest known hymns in scripture where, uh, in, 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 uh, about Jesus, where if you're reading in Philippians and suddenly it goes indented, right? Like it's, it's a song. And they believe it was a song that was sung as people were receiving communion. Right? And there's something powerful to that, I think, because you're singing about God, Jesus who didn't grasp after the hero spot, but poured himself out, made himself nothing to come to us and give his life for us, and we're ingesting this life into us. It's his body that makes us a body. It's his blood that flows through our collective veins. Jesus' self-sacrificial, self-giving life is forming us as his people. It's not just about who Jesus is, it's about who we as the body of Christ are becoming and the power of his spirit. 
But it doesn't end there. It then goes on to say, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place that at, every, at his name every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Jesus doesn't need to grasp after it. He's not striving because the Father will do it for him. Right? The Father loves to exalt the Son. And similarly for us, we can step out of the line. Like we don't need to strive for it. And we can just trust God to do what he's going to do because Jesus says, you know, the, those who attempt to exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So our role is to humble ourselves, to lift up others, to try and as leaders to wrap around those we serve and unleash them in ministry and be able to step out of the limelight and trust God to do what he's going to do with the rest. But we're about his kingdom. And I think it's really interesting. Jesus says, uh, he has this interesting thing he tells his disciples. He says, it's better that I go away, right? As he's getting ready to, to ascend. And you're going like, all right, dude, Jesus, on what universe is it better that you go away? Right? Like, we want you here with us. Jesus goes, it's better that I go away so that the Holy Spirit can come. And then you and I will be one. You'll be in me as I'm in the Father, and we'll all be one. And I think what's going on here is Jesus is going, let's just imagine if he's here, flesh and blood, just face to face, uh, you and me, and it's like, okay, Jesus, I want to make an appointment. Let's get together and hang out, right? And he's like, okay, great. There's 7 billion people in the world, and a lot of them want to hang out too. So I can fit you in maybe 2025, right? <laughs> but Jesus goes, dude, it's better I go away, and I'm going to empower you in my spirit. You're going to be my agents. You're going to be my representatives. You're going to be my ambassadors. And then you're going to go and give it away to others, right? Jesus puts them in the limelight. He steps back. And they're a mess. The disciples are a mess. And Jesus unleashes that, right? And the church goes on through history, unleashing and giving ownership and leadership within the vision and the power of God's spirit. And Jesus is going, dude, our end game, we're going to try and fill this whole alienated world with my holy love. Okay. Well, uh, so what does this mean for us? How do we kind of apply this? I would suggest that we ask ourselves, where is it that I have influence, right? Where do you have influence? What are those areas where I lead in my ministry, my area? And how do I take that? And how do you give your spot away? Right? Give your spot away. I don't mean that by, uh, by that that we check out, right? It's not checking out. All right, I'm going to go to the Bahamas and sip on margaritas and just kind of hang out, right? <laughs> I mean, we're willing to step out of the limelight and put someone else there, and we're actively engaged, but it's, it's, it's a different kind of, we're willing to be behind the scenes in that regard, right? So uh, one example, we had a, a team going with our partners, and they were saying, hey, it'd be great if you could bring some sports equipment. We're like, all right, so we loaded duffel bags, like soccer balls and volleyball nets and that kind of thing, and we were thinking, how can we lift them up and pull ourselves back? We got there, we got there, and we said, hey, you guys take these duffel bags, put them in the shed out back, and don't... Um, put these in the shed, and don't take them out until about two weeks after we leave, and give them to the teachers and let them distribute them. And they were like, really? We're like, yeah. Because here's the deal. It's like, dude, when we come in town, it's like the American Carnival's in town, and we're the sugar, and there's whatever, and the kids are, woo, things are crazy. And then you get on the plane and go back, and the kids are like, ah, we're stuck with our boring school, boring teachers again, right? But here's the thing. Those teachers are the heroes in those kids' lives and story, right? Like, they're the ones who are there day in and day out, week in and week out, pouring into those kids. And so let's let them shine. How can we decrease that they may increase? How can we lift them up and shower them with yeah, just love and affection, right? <laughs> this is my final point. I need to wrap up here, so this is my final point. Uh, that we would also then... I, last piece here, that we would give our spot away by listening first, right? And when we go, we would listen first to what God is doing in their lives and their communities as local churches. So I remember being in Vietnam and in this meeting where there were a number of, uh, I was with a Christian nonprofit and there were a number of pastors in town and, uh, and the nonprofit explained for 30 minutes, hey, here's this vision we have for your community. We want to start this thing here and we're new in town. Here's what we want to do. And I could see the pastor's eyes kind of slowly glazing over as that half hour went on. And at the end, one of the Vietnamese leaders stood up and he said, you know, you guys always do this. Like, you always come here with your plan, your agenda, your vision, everything. But you have, did you think that God might have given us vision? Like, you haven't asked yet. Like, we live here. We know our community. We know our people. Did you think that God might have given us a vision for our community? That convicted me, man. They were like, it would be much better if you would come first and get to know our story, who we are, what God has done in our midst, and the vision that he's given us. And maybe the question becomes, do you want to partner and support with us what we're doing, right? What we're doing. 
So we will be willing to go and listen first to what God is at, doing at work amongst his local people, his leaders, and those that he's put on the ground there. So this is your mission, should you choose to accept it? <laughs> it's to give your spot away, right? Thanks. <laughs>